So hi everyone, I'm Jessie. Uh, thanks for having me here today. I'm really excited to speak all. And today I'm going to be speaking about when online grocery shops go wrong um, and how you can use affinity analytics to improve this. Um, and specifically around the point of when the substitutions within the grocery shops go wrong. So I'm not going to give it any more of an intro than that because I think anyone who's done an online shop at some point or knows anyone who has will recognize this phrase, which is that some of the items you've ordered were out of stock today. Some retailers get this really right, but quite often retailers can get it quite wrong. And then that leads to a really bad customer experience. Um, I've got some examples of this um, that I'm gonna dive straight into to warm you all up. Um, and a bit of a disclaimer is that they're all true. So I've not made any of these up for the purpose of the slides. Um, so I'm gonna set the scene. Imagine you've got your online shop scheduled for 11 a.m. tomorrow. Um, you've planned your lovely cheese roll that you're going to have for your lunch. Um, but unfortunately, when the online shop arrives, your bread rolls have been substituted for sausage rolls. So whilst it's still a type of roll, um, not quite the type of roll you were after, um, but luckily this time um, it's not diabolical and you can still have these for your lunch. So um, not too bad a substitution, unlike my next example, which is a garden fork, which you'd imagine to use in the garden for maybe some digging or weeding. Um, I think you might struggle to use this for it instead, which is what it was substituted for. Um, it would definitely take you a long time to do your gardening with this, and I'm not sure you want to eat your dinner off of it afterwards. Um, another one is these really jazzy red shoelaces um, on the nice white trainer. Um, so imagine your shoelaces are broken, you're doing your online shop, so you're going to put those in your order. Unfortunately, they were out of stock. Um, and they've been substituted in this case for strawberry laces sweets. Um, and again, definitely going to struggle to tie your laces with these. Um, so not an ideal substitution. And I've now got some quick fire ones that I found on a really fantastic Twitter thread called Substitution Fails. So if anyone's got some time on their hands, definitely check it out because it's, it's a right laugh. Um, so this poor person um, ordered a nice bunch of spring show flowers. Um, but unfortunately, this got substituted for a less nice bunch of spring onions. Um, but thankfully, they've maintained their sense of humour and put them in a vase just for the purpose of the tweet. Um, another one is, thanks, I can't wait to crumble some flapjack onto my stir fry tonight. So the poor customer had their soy sauce swapped for some dishes free from flapjack slices. Um, this one is that moment when your Max Factor mascara is substituted with plain poppadoms. I don't even think that needs any explanation as to how bizarre that is. And finally, one of my favourites is imagine going, uh, waking up in the morning, reaching into your cupboard for your loaf of bread to make some toast to actually find out that it's not a loaf of bread and you've actually got to make it yourself. So um, I can understand this person's disappointment that they were writing this tweet. Um, these problems, um, so these are obviously really dramatic examples of it, um, but the substitution problems happen on quite a large scale. And they happen because the pickers in the supermarkets are having to make the decisions really quickly under time pressure, and it's all done manually. Um, so there's naturally going to be some human error involved when they're making the decisions. Um, so imagine if there was a way to automate these decisions, um, they'd be, it would definitely save time and you'd get a much more consistent result. Um, but in order to do this, you need a methodology or a structured way to enable the computer to make the decisions, which is meaning that the computer's going to have to try and think about the um, That's where Affinity Analytics comes in. So it's a, it's a methodology that you can use to achieve this. Uh, but before I go into that in too much detail, I'll give you a little intro to me. Uh, so hi again, I'm Jessie. Uh, I'm an analytics manager at Hypergroup, and I've worked here for about two years now, just coming up to two years. I'm living in Leeds at the minute but I'm from, uh, from Leicester originally, uh, Leicester born and bred. And Leicester's the home of um, Walker's Crisps and a market and me. And that's probably about it, to be honest. Um, and when I'm not at work, when I'm not playing with data, I'm a keen aerialist. So before you ask, that includes like trapeze, silks, aerial hoop or anything you can hang upside down, to be honest. So I'm not just an utter data nerd. Um, if you want to get in touch with me after the talk, uh, feel free to drop me an email or connect with me on LinkedIn. I'll happily answer any, any other questions you've got or that comes to you after you've uh, finished listening to it. Um, or just send me your first supermarket substitution that you've had, because uh, I really enjoy them. It's entertained me quite a lot over the, the last couple of weeks while I've been making the slides. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about my journey into data and how I got to where I am now. So when I finished at school, I moved straight to Leeds and studied maths at university for three years. 
um, mainly focusing on statistics because I enjoyed that because it was very applicable to the real world. Um, and I did a little bit of coding, but nothing really to write home about, to be honest. So naturally, when I graduated, I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, thankfully, I fell into quite a nice first graduate role as a credit risk analyst at a payday and loan company. Um, if I'm being honest, I had no idea what credit risk or analyst meant when I first took it. I just thought it sounded all right. Uh, and thankfully it was. So it gave me a really good basis of how to work in analytics that set me up nicely for the rest of my career. Um, thankfully, I learned how to code uh, using SQL mainly, which again, I've used um, substantially as I've gone on through later jobs. Um, and I learned how to develop models like propensity to default models or forecasting. Um, after working here, I moved to a company called Everyone Health, um, which is a public health company. So they provide services like weight management or stop smoking at various places around the UK. Um, and I was a data analyst there. So my main role was to report on how well the services were performing. Um, I learned a lot of this job actually, because um, the, the main thing being, I learned how to translate technical topics to a non-technical audience. Because part of my role was once I produced the report, I'd have to drive to wherever in the UK the service was being um, performed and explain to the County Council Commissioner that was running it why the service was either overperforming or underperforming. So obviously that was a challenge, but I learned a lot. Um, and also it was a really small company. So I got a lot of exposure to different areas of the business as well that wasn't directly related to my role. So things like interviewing, um, workload management, uh, presenting, all types of work. After working there, um, I moved to William Hill and was a BI analyst there. Um, this was the first time I'd worked at a big company, um, which is an experience in itself. I imagine anyone who's worked at a big company will know. Uh, and um, it, was, but it was great because I got a lot of exposure to working in uh, large scale business changes and like, reporting on them and collecting lots of data for them. Um, and also because I worked for specifically the retail estate, I had to tailor my reports to a really wide variety of audiences. So obviously William Hill is a big company, so they've got big stakeholders that you're having to report to, but also they've got a lot of shops. And my reports had to be tailored so that they could be uh, digested by the, the employees that were working at the shops. So um, I, I had to do a, a, like a wide variety of work and use quite a different um, amount of tooling. And finally, I'm now at Hyper Group. Um, I came to Hyper as a data scientist, but I'm more recently an analytics manager here. And whilst I've been here, I've worked on a variety of different analytical and data science projects across our two main clients um, and used loads of different tools, to be honest, because um, we basically use whatever is going to work best for the client that we're working with. So whether that's SQL, Power BI, Python, Excel, Alteryx, you name it, we've probably used it at some point. Um, and to be honest, as I look back through the whole journey of my journey into data, I can kind of see how everything I've learned at my previous jobs is now tied together really nicely in my role at Hypergroup. Um, so yeah, that's probably why I love it here so much. So I'll tell you a little bit more around what, about what Hyper do. So quite simply, we help retailers and brands to use their data so that they can understand their customers better. Once you've got a better understanding of your customers, the decisions you're making are going to be more customer centric which provides the customers with a lot more personalised experience, which is in turn then a better customer experience, which is the aim for, um, for, mo for most retailers and companies, to be honest. Um, we do this in two ways. There's a consultancy side of the business, which is where I work. Um, so we work with retailers and brands either as a retained service or on a project, a project by project basis to provide them with customer insights and hands-on data science and BI so that they understand their customers and they can use that to then make the decisions they need to. There's also another side to the business, um, which is our software as a service platform called Hyperfinity. Um, and this is being built in order to provide non-technical users within companies to actually be able to self-serve the data to themselves when they've got a customer question that they need to answer. They can go into Hyperfinity and find out um, the insight that they need to be able to make their decisions. You might ask why this is needed. Um, and it's a good question, um, but generally um, companies that use data um, can understand their customers a lot better and providing, as I said, a better customer experience. Then. And it's well known that if customers have a better experience, they're a lot likely, more likely to be loyal and then go on to spend more um, and shop more, which is the aim. Um, however, within companies and especially within large scale companies, the data that they have is often fractured around different areas of the business, which means that the data science and the insights um, that come from it are often quite siloed, which means that the decision making is often really fragmented. Um, so when they're trying to answer this broad range of questions, it's really hard to know where to get the data from to do that. Um, this in turn then leads to really um, disjointed poor customer experiences for the customers, really similar to the bad substitutions that we saw at the beginning. So that's why those kind of things are happening. 
Um, and then the bad customer experiences lead to the customers spending less, they lose their loyalty, and then um, there's less profits for the company. However, what Hyper do is they aim to bridge the gap between this um, to enable the customer-led decision-making to all come from one place, whether that's driven by Hyperfinity, um, driving decisions across all of these um, areas, or whether we deliver that through consultancy work. Um, we use both to um, help improve the customer experience for the company. However, that's obviously quite high level. It's very theoretical. Um, how do we actually do it? Um, so we use affinity analytics um, predominantly. Uh, so affinity analytics is the backbone of the product we're building, but also it's used in a lot of the consultancy work that we do as well. Um, there's three main components to affinity analytics, um, which are here in the three boxes. And I'm going to vaguely explain them now, but I'll go into them in a little bit more detail as we go on. So Affinity is the relationships between products, customers, and looking at what the customers are buying in each of their visits. Um, attributes is a rich language that you can use to describe the products that you're offering. And then customer needs states are groups of products that satisfy a particular customer need. So that's what each of the three are. Um, but I think it might help to apply it to one of the examples that I talked about earlier. So I'll pick my favorite one, which was the shoelaces to sweet strawberry laces example. So let's imagine we work for Supermarket X and uh, one of our customers has come onto our online shop and has tried to order the red shoelaces, but unfortunately we've not got them in stock. How can we get our computer to automate the decisions as to what to substitute it for using Affinity Analytics? So I'm gonna start with Affinity because you only need quite simple data to generate these. All you need to know is what your customers are buying, so which products they're buying in each of their visits. Once you know this, you can calculate something called basket affinities, which are combinations of products that are bought within the same visit. Um, and you can also calculate customer affinities that are combinations of products that customers are buying, but not necessarily within the same visit. So just during their lifespan of shopping with you. Um, once you've got these basket affinities and customer affinities, you can combine them together, together and then you can infer whether the combinations of products are complementary to each other. So that means that they're really likely to be bought in the same visit and then would make for good product bundles or would make for good recommendations. So for example, uh, when it says, oh, you, I think you might have forgotten to add this to your basket, you usually buy these together in the same visit. That's also to do with complementary products. When you use the basket affinities and customer affinities together in another way, you can infer whether products compete against each other. And then that means that demand can be transferred between them. And then these are the ones that we're really interested in today because the uh, competing products are the ones that make for really good substitutions. So I've got an example of this on a really small scale. Um, so I'm going to introduce Hyper Harry to you now. Um, he's in uh, at the side of this slide here. And he's going to represent our full customer base um, in his green cap and the shoes that we've seen before, but don't look too closely because they are on the wrong feet. Um, so he is entering our online shop or entering our store and he's in his first visit, he's going to buy um, unbranded cornflakes, unbranded milk, and then this particular dashing variety of red shoelace. In his second visit, he's buying exactly the same cornflakes and milk, but a different type of red shoelace. And then in his third visit, he's again buying cornflakes, milk, and another third variety of red shoelace. Um, so from these three visits, we can infer that the cornflakes and the milk are complementary products because they're often brought together in the same visit. However, because the customers bought the three different types of shoelace, but never together in the same visit, then we could infer that these products compete against each other. So demand could be transferred between them. <laughs> However, uh, uh, this is quite an abstract example because I can't imagine. <laughs> uh, this, is, I'll just repeat that. Um, this is quite an abstract example because I can't imagine that that anyone is buying um, three different varieties of red shoelace in each of their consecutive visits. So I think it might be easier to imagine it in terms of carrots. Um, we, I use carrots a lot as a good example, because let's imagine in the store, in the online shop, you could buy loose carrots, or you could buy bagged carrots, or you could buy unbranded carrots. So when you're entering the shop um, and you're looking for the carrots that you're gonna use for your roast dinner on a Sunday, you're probably not bothered which type of carrots you're actually gonna buy. So on your first visit, you might decide to buy loose carrots. Or on your second visit, you might decide to buy bags of carrots. And then on your third visit, you might decide to buy unbranded carrots. Um, however, you're really unlikely to actually buy 
any combination of those different types of carrots in the same visit because who needs loose carrots and bags of carrots for the same for the same meal um, so then again we can infer that these three different types of carrots are competing against each other um, and again it's probably worth pointing out that this example is quite oversimplified because we're kind of just looking at it for one customer and their three visits it's very rare that you would look at this for one customer you probably you definitely want to extrapolate it over the full customer base because then you can pick out the strongest relationships that apply to the product range um, or that are really relevant for a large number of customers so that these are really valid relationships. But hopefully that just explains how you can get to which products that customers are buying are complementary to each other and which products compete for demand against each other. So that's affinity. I'm going to move on to attributes now. So I'll just recap what I said before, which is that attributes, well, to be honest, they're just basically ways that you can describe products and different ways in which you can describe them. So. For our shoelaces example, um, I've put some attributes here. So these are descriptors that you could use to tag um, what the red shoelaces are. And there's different ways in which you can make these. So you can use product metadata to make attributes, um, and then you can make rules-based attributes based off of these. Um, and so these are quite simple like descriptors of what the product actually is. Um, so in this case, in my examples that I've got up here, I can pick out the red, um, that would be a rules-based attribute. So would low price, so would footwear, and so would polyester. That's just describing what the product actually is. Some more interesting ways that you can make attributes um, is that one of them is that you can use customer review data and natural language processing um, to pick out attributes from the reviews. And this is great because the attributes are then actually describing the way in which a customer would describe the product to someone else. So that's a really powerful way to be able to describe the laces. Um, so if we look at my examples here, you could say that flimsy, fashionable and good value for money. They're all ways, um, types of attributes that you could get on customer review data. And finally, a really interesting one is that you can actually use affinity to develop attributes. So um, there's quite a few ways you can do this, but I'll just focus on a, a simple one to hopefully make the point quite clear. Um, if you use your customer affinities that I spoke about before, you could get a group of customers that are really likely to buy these red shoelaces. And then if you look at the demographics of these customers, you could say, well, these customers that are really likely to buy the red shoelaces are also predominantly young people, or they're also predominantly families. And then you get, you're, you're getting extra attributes that you could append to your shoelaces in that way. So you can see here, I've got the young attribute um, who are apparently more likely to buy the red shoelaces, which I completely made up. So I don't tell that's gospel. Um, and yeah, so hopefully that explains what attributes are. And finally, I'll go on to customer need states. So as I said, customer need states are groups of products um, that satisfy a particular customer need. And you actually use affinity and attributes in combination to get to customer need states. So you use your affinities to identify which of your products was, are competing against each other. So you could transfer demand between them. And you can also use attributes to say, well, within um, our customer needs state, are the products really similar? So are the attributes that are appended to them really similar? And you can use them in combination to get to your need states. Oh, right. um, then the customer needs states are really useful because if you group your whole product range in this way, um, you're actually viewing the product range through the eyes of the customer. So it's almost mimicking the decisions that the customer is going to make as they are traveling through your store or going through um, doing their online shop on your website. Um, and it differs to how it often um, happens that products are grouped together in the eyes of how traders would view them. Um, so if you're doing it in the trading way rather than the customer way, the decisions you make off the back of the, um, the product groupings are less likely to be customer centric. So again, I've obviously got another example of this using Hyper Harry. Um, so he's entered our online store and um, we know his end goal is to buy the red shoelaces. So that's his customer needs state that he's after. However, hopefully this flow diagram will kind of try and explain how we would help the customer um, automate what the decisions that Hyper Harry is going to make as he goes through the store to get to the customer needs state. And then that in turn shows how you could automate it. So he's entering his online shop. The first decision he needs to make is today, do I want to shop fashion or do I want to shop grocery? So we know he wants to shop fashion. So we'll go with that. Um, once he's made that decision, he needs to decide, do I want to buy clothes or do I want to buy shoes? Uh, so we know he's after his laces, so he wants to buy shoes. Next is, am I buying actual shoes or do I need some accessories for my shoes? And laces are definitely accessories, so we're going there. And next is, do I want insoles or do I want laces? And again, obviously laces. And once he's decided upon the laces, all he needs to decide left is, do I want them to be red or do I want them to be a multitude of other colors? 
and we know that um, he wants them to be red. So he's now reached his customer need state, and within that customer need state is a group of products that you could pick from to satisfy that. Um, so you can imagine that even if Harry had ordered one particular type of red shoelace um, in his online shop, but that was unfortunately out of stock. If we swapped it for any of the other types of red shoelace, whilst he might be a little bit missed that it wasn't exactly right, it's still satisfying that customer need. So he's less likely to say that that was a bad customer experience. He's still likely to be quite satisfied with that swap. Um, so hopefully that explains affinity analytics in a bit more detail. Um, clearly, when you're looking at these two products that had been swapped for each other, using common sense and by eyes, you can say like, I would never actually pick to swap these two products. However, from what I've explained before, I hope you can now see how a computer could be used to make these decisions for you through the eyes of the customer. So um, obviously you would never expect strawberry lace suites and the red shoe laces to be in the same customer needs state because they're definitely not satisfying the same customer needs. Um, you'd never think that the affinities um, would identify these two products as competing against each other because you definitely not expect um, dem demand to be transferred between them. And focusing on attributes, I won't talk about them for shoelaces because I've obviously already been through that in detail. But if I just spitball a few ideas for the suites, um, attributes you, you'd think for pens and sweets could be something like um, more food, for one, um, edible, or like from a review, maybe like tasty. Um, and you definitely wouldn't be describing your shoelaces, anything like that. So um, you can see why the computer would very rarely pick this as a substitution if you're using affinity analytics. Um, another point I wanted to make was that affinity analytics doesn't just have to be used for substitutions. You can use it for loads of other things like recommendations, um, predicting demand transference, product ranging, optimizing pricing. And also it doesn't need to just be used in retail. Quite a lot of companies and brands also use affinity analytics in different ways. Um, um, a really important one is a bit of a kind of pioneers in this area, really. Um, and I've provided you here with a screenshot of my Netflix account um, to make the point and explain it a bit better. So first of all, I just want to point out that I watch all of my top tier TV on my boyfriend's account. So please don't judge me for the screenshot. Um, however, it, it's useful to explain the point. So Netflix will use Affinity Analytics to personalize pretty much everything you see on this page. So the three rows there of content have all been personalized and recommended specifically for me. Um, so Netflix obviously thinks that I'm going to enjoy young adult films and programs or rom-coms. So to be honest, it's not probably not far wrong. Um, it's also personalizing the actual TV shows that it's been shown. So Mean Girls, Glee, Legally Blonde, um, Pitch Perfect. And most interestingly, I think it actually personalizes the visuals that it will show you to um, like explain what the TV show is. So that particular picture that's showing for me girls there, that's also been personalized against a few other options using Affinity Analytics. And it's not just Netflix that do this. There's quite a lot of brands um, and companies that you'll have heard of that all use Affinity Analytics in different ways. And there's quite a lot of um, content and information online about this. So if you're interested in reading any more, if you just give it a quick Google, especially for Netflix, there's loads you can find to read out a bit more online. Um, and I think that's everything I wanted to cover on that topic. Um, if you're interested in finding out more, you can uh, visit our website. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about what we actually do, there's plenty of stuff on there. But we've also got lots of blogs that you can read um, going into these topics in a little bit more detail. If you'd like to keep up to date on what we're actually working on at the minute, um, you can follow us on Twitter or connect with us on LinkedIn. There's plenty of stuff on there. Um, recently, we've made a podcast called To Affinity and Beyond that goes into topics such as which brands are winning at Affinity Analytics. And there's one about um, how TikTok uses Affinity Analytics to do its recommendations uh, for its For You page. So hopefully you'll find those interesting. And we're also um, planning a leads-based meetup to start soon uh, that's hoping to create a bit of a data science and analytics community um, covering topics um, of consumer analytics. So not just specifically Affinity Analytics, like general consumer analytics too. So um, we're actually looking for speakers as well. So if anyone's interested, feel free to drop me a message. And last but not least, we're also hiring. So um, if there's any enthusiastic data analysts, data scientists, data engineers, or software engineers that um, like the sound of what we work on and the uh, methodologies that we use and are interested, uh, feel free to contact this email address or just drop me a message. Um, I'll happily answer any questions you've got. Um, so thanks very much, everyone, for listening. Um, I'll happily answer any questions you've got. I hope you enjoyed. <laughs>